Right, well, I think we'll get started now. Big, very well, warm welcome to all of you uh, to this workshop on Indigenous food systems, biocultural heritage and the SDGs. It's great to see so many of you uh, from different cultures. My name is Christina Swiderska. I'm a researcher at IIED, uh, focusing on biocultural heritage and food systems. And um, I'm very pleased to be organizing this workshop um, with Q Botanic Gardens. Um, this workshop consists of a series of four webinars. Today and next week, we're having three more webinars. They're all linked, part of the same workshop. So to provide a bit of introduction to the workshop, um, I firstly um, wanted to say that this workshop is quite unusual in, in some ways. Um, firstly, because it brings together a, a really wide variety of participants. So we have universities, um, we have Kew Gardens, and we have researchers covering a range of disciplines. So humanities, botany, and also interdisciplinary uh, subjects like ethnobotany. And we also have um, action researchers like IIED and our southern partners um, who are working to promote environmental sustainability and to empower indigenous peoples and also to influence policy. And then we have a number of indigenous representatives um, from the Arctic, the Sami Council, uh, Brazil, Peru, Kenya, Botswana, Chad, India, China, the Philippines and Thailand. So it's wonderful to have uh, so many different participants. I think we, we all need to work together to address the big challenges facing Indigenous people's food systems. So this, this workshop is also unusual in that the focus Indigenous food systems have not received a lot of attention from researchers or from policymakers. And also because we're focusing on whole food systems, so not just production, not just Indigenous crops, but also the preparation, the processing and the cooking methods that are needed to enable their consumption. So the objectives of the workshop, firstly, is to promote an equitable and inclusive intercultural dialogue where all types of knowledge are valued equally. Secondly, uh, to explore the role of Indigenous people's food systems in achieving the sustainable development goals. And we also want to explore new ideas for empowering interdisciplinary research on indigenous people's food systems and to build new networks and partnerships that bring together these different disciplines and different actors. So I'm really pleased that we're organizing this workshop with Philippa Ryan from Kew Gardens. She's an ethnobotanist and archaeobotanist. And this workshop forms part of a joint project um, on indigenous food systems, biocultural heritage and agricultural resilience, which is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK and the Global Challenges Research Fund. So I would like to just provide a little bit of background now on indigenous people's food systems. Um, first of all, um, there are about 476 million Indigenous peoples in total, um, speaking more than 4,000 languages. And Indigenous peoples are the custodians of about 80% of the world's biodiversity. But this rich biocultural diversity is facing unprecedented threats. The UN recently announced that none of the 2020 Aichi biodiversity targets will be met. And UNESCO has estimated that over 20 indigenous languages are lost each year. And with the loss of indigenous cultures and languages and the passing of indigenous elders, we are losing unique ecological knowledge, values and worldviews for biodiversity conservation and for sustainable development. Sadly, many indigenous peoples have suffered violent colonization and indigenous peoples continue to be colonized today in different ways by dominant Euro-Western cultures. They continue to suffer widespread racial discrimination and marginalization and growing violence against environmental defenders. For decades, indigenous peoples have been calling for their rights to land and self-determination to be respected. 
These rights are, are now enshrined in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but unfortunately their rights are still widely threatened and many Indigenous peoples are still struggling to be recognised as Indigenous peoples. COVID-19 has been devastating for the health of many Indigenous peoples, but it has also demonstrated the great resilience of their localised food systems, which have provided a vital safety net during this crisis. Indigenous food systems are very diverse, but they also have a number of common features. So they sustain high levels of biodiversity, including many of the world's underutilized species and varieties through agroecological practices and adaptive resource management and the protection of sacred sites. They promote efficient use of natural resources, for example, through circular farming methods, soil and water conservation, and they use a lot less water than modern chemical intensive farming systems and emit a lot less carbon. They also sustain vital ecosystem services and are often more resilient to climate change than modern farming systems and modern crop varieties. Indigenous crops and land races have also been found to be more nutritious than their modern hybrid equivalents. And another common feature is that indigenous food systems are rooted in indigenous cultures and identity and spirituality and solidarity. So across the world, many indigenous food systems are already achieving zero hunger. So that's SDG2. But the transition to modern foods is leading to growing health problems in, in, in Western countries, but also in Southern countries. So obesity and, and diabetes is increasingly prevalent. And in some climate constrained areas like um, the Sahel, the loss of traditional knowledge is directly linked to hunger and food insecurity, according to the World Food Programme. So indigenous food systems are critical for achieving many SDGs, not just ending hunger, but also protecting ecosystems and biodiversity, SDG 15, SDG 13 on climate action, SDG 1 and 10 on ending poverty and inequality, and SDG 3 on health and well-being. But unfortunately, they are uh, often seen as, as backward or unproductive and are often undermined by policies promoting industrial agri-food systems and resource extraction and protected areas. So indigenous peoples not only conserve biodiversity, but they've created biodiversity rich landscapes and a huge diversity of domesticated crops and livestock over generations. This biodiversity is their cultural heritage. When native potato varieties were repatriated to Andean communities in the Potato Park in Peru, the indigenous knowledge and the culture and the rituals embedded in those varieties were also revived. And of course, indigenous women play a key role in sustaining these food systems from nurturing seeds to cuisine. So the concept of biocultural heritage reflects indigenous people's holistic worldviews where indigenous knowledge and biodiversity and landscapes and cultural and spiritual values are inextric inextricably linked. So the biodiversity and the cultural heritage is inextricably linked and cannot be separated. This concept emerged from um, work with Quechua communities in the Potato Park by the NGO Asociación Andes and also was validated through research by IIED and partners. It bridges sectoral silos and bridges knowledge systems, and it also reaffirms the rights of indigenous peoples over their ancestral genetic resources and landscapes. So um, before handing over to IID's um, director to say a few words, I am just to briefly introduce the four webinars. So today we have some opening presentations and then we'll have half an hour break and then we'll have a live streamed interaction with indigenous experts in the potato park, which you can see behind me. Then next week on Tuesday, we will explore indigenous food systems in China, India and Kenya. And these are the three case studies in our AHRC grant. 
And then on Wednesday next week, we'll explore Indigenous people's priorities for research on Indigenous food systems and also the interdisciplinary research gaps that need addressing. And then finally, on Thursday, we'll look at interdisciplinary research methods and decolonizing research methods. So the results of these four webinars we're going to use to help us design new research on Indigenous food systems and also to inform a number of policy processes in 2021. So the Biodiversity Convention, COP15, the World Food Systems Summit and the Climate Change, COP26. So finally, I just wanted to say a very warm welcome to all of you and uh, please can I remind you to try and speak slowly and clearly and avoid using technical jargon. Thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to introduce Andrew Norton, who is the director of IID, to say a few words. Thank you. Well, huge thanks, Christina, and many thanks to you and to everyone here also for giving me the honour of kind of kicking off with some welcoming remarks. Um, I joined IID about five years ago. IID, I guess, if you have to describe it very quickly, our, our main um, passion is for social and environmental justice. And it's harder to think of any topic that is more uh, central to that than the one that you will be discussing. Um, personally, I'm a social anthropologist by background. I did my um, first set of field work in West Africa in Mali, and this also resonates hugely with me at a personal level, so it's a real honour to be introducing this session. Um, just a few thoughts from me about really the global context for your discussions. Um, it's seemed to me that the IPBES uh, big blockbuster report of 2019, the Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, um, was a kind of watershed moment, a bit like the IPCC 1.5 uh, report on climate change. It's pushed these issues in a much more solid way into global public debate. Um, and there's one particular conclusion of that report that I'd like to highlight. I'm sure many of you will be familiar. Um, this is from the summary for policymakers. Nature is generally declining less rapidly in indigenous people's lands than in other lands. So that's a really significant finding, hugely significant, obviously, for CBD and for the, the COP15 that's been postponed to next year. So, I mean, two questions about that. The first is, why do you get that result? Um, and I think the material that you'll be discussing here is really the bulk of the answer to that. Um, food systems, livelihood systems that are embedded in cultural systems that have evolved through deep ancestral knowledge over generations um, produces that better stewardship of ecosystems and of the natural world that we see in that result. Um, but then there's the question also of, you know, if we have cultures that are skilled and highly effective at understanding and managing the local natural world, what does that finding imply? And I guess the first thing is that it implies an urgent need to better protect the natural resource rights the, and the, indeed the human rights and local um, space for agency and self-determination of indigenous peoples worldwide. Um, this is a broad and very political agenda and a very challenging agenda, but a really urgent one. And the emphasis on global biodiversity can, I think, push us um, to see that in more urgent and stark terms. Um, Christina mentioned in her introduction the, the terrible impact that COVID has had on some indigenous peoples at a health level, but there is also disturbing emerging picture from some countries. I don't think the evidence is yet aggregated much that COVID can also provide a cover for the rollback of these rights and this kind of control as well. I mean, obviously in certain environments rather than others, um, but that is also something we need to be very aware of and um, need to seek any way we can really of promoting mobilization around protecting those critical, that critical right to self-determination, agency and natural resource rights that is central to this agenda. Um, but the other, I guess, implication from the IPBES finding 
is what can be learned from the lands that are under, um, if you like, management or control of indigenous peoples um, to help the world find ways of having better stewardship on a global scale of biodiversity. So there's also the question of, are there transferable lessons? If so, what are they? And how can that um, benevolent impact that uh, the sort of management of local food systems, local livelihood systems has on local biodiversity? How can that be made more meaningful at a global level? So it's just a final word that, I mean, the topic of this uh, seminar is incredibly important, incredibly relevant. Um, and it also has, I think, compelling uh, connections to the actions that we need to take on a global scale to protect our natural world. Christina, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, IPBES is the Intergovernmental Panel for Ecosystem Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. <laughs> um, that's great, really useful background, Andy. Um, I'm now going to um, ask uh, Philippa Ryan from Kew Gardens, who's um, going to say a few words of introduction. Thanks. Hi everyone, it's great to see so many of you here today from such a broad range of disciplines, cultures and backgrounds. The research into indigenous food systems and crops um, has tended to cross cut many academic disciplines and organisations. There can be many different aims and methods and as a result research can often remain largely disconnected and often focuses on particular elements within food systems. Holistic approaches would reflect the interconnectedness between crop diversity, environments and agricultural practices, between crop choices and foods, and between traditional agricultural and food knowledge and heritage. So one of the aims of this workshop is to bring together academics and researchers spanning lots of disciplines and methods to try and create ideas for more interdisciplinary approaches which are set within the framework of local priorities, cultural contexts and broad ranging aims. So, for example, exploring the potential of ethnobotany as an approach that naturally helps to connect botanical sciences and humanities and can also link studies across um, different, connect, um, different uh, components of food systems uh, from crops through to cuisine. Um, and also to consider historical approaches, such as documenting farmers' memories about disappearing crops or changing practices and local foods. And also potentially drawing on archival and archaeological sources to find out more about long-term crop histories. So while people often think of Kew as a taxonomic institute, food, food security and ethnobotany are also very big subjects here. And these are always grounded on taxonomy because accurate plant identification and understanding the evolutionary relationships underpins research into underutilized and threatened crops and global conservation efforts. And although Kew is an old institution, it has adapted. It's been a leader in the practical application of the conservation of biological diversity, including prior informed consent and benefit sharing, and its projects are all firmly grounded in participatory approaches. It's very fitting that we're co-hosting this meeting, but of course we can always do better. And prompted by all the events of this summer, a staff-led initiative, Decolonizing Q, with strong support from the director and director of science, is both re-examining Q's history and also aspects of the way we do and communicate science to see how we can do better. Um, so it's very, um, fitting that we're co-hosting this, this meeting and discussions in this workshop will um, surely contribute to this process. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to hearing all your thoughts and ideas and I'll pass back to Christina. Great, thanks so much, Philippa. It's great to hear about the Decolonizing Q program. Um, so I think we need to move on. Um, to the opening presentations. Um, so first of all, we have the FAO. Um, so I'd like to introduce Jon Fernandez de Larinoa, who is the head of the FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit. And also Anne Brunel is the focal point on Indigenous food systems in the Indigenous Peoples Unit at FAO. 
and I would like to say I'm going to keep track on time. Um, the speakers have 10 minutes and when you have one minute left, I'm going to do this. My African drum, I hope you can hear it. <laughs> so please, um, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, um, Christina. And, and thank you so much to um, Andrew Norton uh, um, for the invitation. And of course, to Philippa Ryan. Um, first of all, it is a great pleasure to, to present with um, Georgie Carino, um, Simon Mitambo, uh, Jules Pretty, and of course, uh, Harriet Kunlein, with whom we have been collaborating for several years. Um, my name is John Fernando de la Rinoa. I head the Indigenous Peoples Unit in FAO, and I will be presented together with Anne Brunel. Now, uh, you might be wondering what is FAO doing in relation to uh, Indigenous Peoples Food Systems. Let me start with uh, the first take home message. Um, and it is that food systems, as we have conceived them so far, will not be able to feed humanity in a sustainable way unless they are reinvented with a much stronger environmental considerations included. Uh, the second message I would like to start with is that today academic scientists are more open towards other forms of knowledge, including indigenous scientific knowledge. And this is partly due to the unanswered questions raising from the COVID-19. Uh, the previous uh, presenters talked about uh, decolonizing and uh, my third take home message will be that we need to start by decolonizing our own minds. That's where most of the difficulties are starting. Now, as you may know, there is an ongoing global debate on food systems um, and uh, everybody's looking at how they can be made more sustainable and resilient in the face of climate change. This discussion started in the frame of the UN Decade of Action on Nutrition, uh, which has served as an umbrella for a number of important initiatives, like the voluntary guidelines on nutrition and food systems that are being discussed in the Committee on World Food Security. But probably the most important uh, discussion forum that we have ahead of us is the UN Food Systems Summit, which is going to be organized in 2021 under the frame of the UN Decade of Action. Uh, it is expected that this UN Food Systems Summit is going to put forward uh, policies and conceptual framework for the next 20 years in relation to uh, uh, food systems. So it is a great opportunity for indigenous peoples and the tremendous knowledge that they have accumulated for centuries to be put at the table of the discussions, to be put at from, and to, to show all of us how they've been feeding their populations uh, for hundreds of years, and yet, as, as, as it was mentioned earlier, they still managed to preserve 80% of the remaining biodiversity. That means that a lot of the biodiversity we have managed to annihilate it by other forms of production, other forms of, uh, of generation of food. Now, the work of FAO on indigenous food systems started in 2015. And uh, this was the recommendation from indigenous leaders to include a dedicated area of work on indigenous food systems. But uh, in a way, uh, the work started earlier. It started by the nutrition division in 2009. And this was thanks to, uh, to, peop to, to experts like uh, Harriet uh, Kulnen, that is with us today of McGill and Cine, uh, Chief Erasmus and other experts. So that's when FAO started putting together um, the, a conceptual framework to look into indigenous food systems from a nutrition and sustainability point of view. In 2017, together with Biodiversity International, we developed a methodology to profile indigenous food systems uh, across the world, looking into uh, particularly all the sustainability characteristics. Uh, we've been working on, on several uh, indigenous food systems across the world. Some of them we have managed to publish, others have not been published. And uh, this is an ongoing work that we are doing with indigenous uh, organizations and research institutions that have a, a field orientation all over the world. Let me continue by saying that uh, the methodology that was developed to profile all, it did, all of these indigenous food systems is looking at uh, sustainability and resilience in the terms of adequacy of income generation, the adequacy of diet, the natural resource use, ecosystem conservation and resilience. Uh, the methodology is based on the five principles of sustainability and is also inspired in the SHARP indicators with a strong look into the use of energy uh, within the systems. 
Let me pass the floor to my colleague, Anne Brunel, who is going to talk about the high-level expert seminar that was put together in 2018 in a field to advance conceptually this framework. Over to you, Anne. Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to all. So um, I will continue briefly on the expert seminar that uh, FAO co-organized in 2018, together with SPILAC, uh, UN Permanent Forum, UNESCO, and DOSIP. Um, so uh, just, uh, just to give you an idea, it was the first time in FAO history that uh, we could organize or we organized a high-level expert seminar on indigenous people food systems. And it gathered uh, 200 participants from uh, 22 indigenous peoples, uh, 20 universities. Uh, we had 23 country delegates and, and 70 of the 200 participants uh, were speakers. So I will go now through the main uh, technical discussions and I stop my presentation here for the moment. Um, on the main technical discussions that were uh, during the three days. So we talk about nine topics mainly um, on the contribution of indigenous uh, people's food system to zero hunger, so SDG2. Uh, the tradition and trains indigenous food systems, how uh, knowledge is transmitted from the elders to the youth generation, access to markets, climate change and resilience, the use of natural resources, uh, diets and nutrition, uh, governance systems. We also had a look at a uh, shift in cultivation and how uh, it can enhance the sustainability of the food systems. And then in the end, we had also a special uh, discussion on the food systems in the mountain areas. So that was really the, the topic during the, the, the three days. And key messages came out of these uh, thematic discussions. So I will go through them uh, one by one. So uh, in fine, we recognized that uh, indigenous food systems are efficient food systems. Uh, they feed local people in a nutritious way. And at the same time, they keep the balance of a fragile environment. We also recognize that the indigenous cultures and ecosystems is uh, uh, survival is dependent on the preservation and the transmission of traditional knowledge. We also saw that in, uh, innovation and con uh, commercialization, sorry, um, of indigenous foods and on indigenous foods needs to include indigenous peoples uh, from the very beginning to the end uh, of the value change in all process and mechanism. We also saw that indigenous food systems are a big part of the solution uh, against uh, climate change in the fight against climate change. We also saw that the natural resource management of indigenous peoples uh, needs uh, is um, very important and needs to be integrated in all decision making uh, in, of governments related to management of a land. We recognize the need to further the research on food composition uh, of uh, indigenous food for food security and nutrition of indigenous communities. Um, we also stressed on the governance practices of indigenous peoples and how it should be recognized by uh, national um, nations and countries. And finally, we saw the many dimensions of sustainability of shifting cultivation, which is not seen as a practice only, but as a holistic uh, lifestyle. So if I go to, to develop uh, on, the, on the way to learn, uh, the way forward of the food of the, this expert seminar, the three objectives were to enhance the learning, the preservation, and the promotion of indigenous food systems. So the key recommendation that uh, the expert made based on these key messages were to enhance uh, dedicated uh, participatory research and documentation uh, on food systems uh, with indigenous communities, uh, to establish also mechanism of collaboration and research that enables the blending of traditional knowledge and uh, scientific knowledge systems. We also said that it was important to enhance the research on food composition, as I said already earlier, and to map institutions, laws and norms at country level, which can harm indigenous food systems. And on this point, uh, I would like also to make a highlight 
uh, based on the profiling that we did and that Jan presented, we realize how much policy conservations, also well intended, can harm the indigenous people's food systems. And so uh, one of the uh, one aspects that could be developed further in how is how this uh, conservation policies affect the sustainability of the food systems. Um, we also thought that it could be interesting to develop research on the role of customary institutions and indigenous knowledge in the preservation of the food systems, the role of women in the in the indigenous food systems, and I'm almost done. And so, um, and so to end up uh, with uh, this, all these recommendations, one of the main output was the creation of the Global Hub on Indigenous Food Systems, uh, that will gather all these messages. Uh, is a platform reuniting actors uh, and enhance the, word, the work toward food systems. And I will pass the floor back to you again. I'm sorry, Jan, uh, for the very last words. No, oh, that's fine. Uh, Christina, indulge me with, uh, with one minute and, um, and I will, we will complete the presentation. Um, the Global Hub uh, on Indigenous People's Food Systems was launched uh, last week, uh, last Friday at the FAO Technical Committee on Agriculture where the ministers of agriculture uh, gather uh, every two years. And it was officially endorsed by FAO members. Now, the main objective of this global hub is to support the incorporation- Sorry, I can't hear you very well. Could you speak closer to the mic, please? It's better. Hello, yeah. If I swallow the mic, please uh, help me out. Uh, can you hear me now, Christina? Yeah, all right. Um, I was saying that the main objective of this global hub is to support the incorporation of indigenous food systems uh, at the global, regional, and national uh, policy debates about food systems. Uh, it is a platform that right now brings together uh, 17 institutions that are doing uh, research and analysis together with indigenous peoples in the ground. The founding members are Biodiversity International, uh, C4, ECRAF, the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples, AIPP, and FAO. But ever since the launching of the hub, uh, Senesta, Filac, Gaia Amazonas, the University of Greenwich, uh, Infoots, Massey University, McGill University, Monash University, the Sami Parliament from Finland, the Indigenous Partnership for Agrobiodiversity and Food Sovereignty, UNESCO, and UNCCC have also joined the Global Hub. We will be providing more information about the, what is planned for the Global Hub on the session on Wednesday, 14th of October, uh, during the third webinar. So let me stop here, uh, thanking you for your attention and passing the floor over to you, Christina. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jon Fernandez and, and Brunel. It's really great to have you part of this workshop. We can build on that seminar that you had in 2018 that brought together so many Indigenous peoples and identified these key challenges um, and can't wait to hear more about the hub um, next choose next Wednesday so um, we we now have um, a presentation by uh, Joji Carinho, Carinho sorry um, about indigenous food systems in Asia and uh, Joji is an um, Abaloy Igorot uh, from the Cordillera in the Philippines and she is a policy, senior policy advisor at the Forest Peoples Programme so we're really pleased to have you here and also a very long-term um, active advocacy on biodiversity convention on indigenous issues. Please go ahead Joji, welcome. Thanks very much uh, Christina. Um, I'd like to greet all of you from my hometown in Baguio City here in the Philippines uh, to share some perspectives on indigenous uh, food systems uh, uh, with a focus on Asia. Um, in Asia, similar to other regions of the world, uh, mainstream economic development and modern agriculture focused on commercial crops and plantations has actually overtaken traditional farming by many indigenous communities, also leading to a devaluation and uh, erosion of indigenous and local knowledge. Uh, nonetheless, indigenous food systems are alive 
and uh, there is uh, an important um, job ahead of us of revitalization of uh, indigenous and local food systems. Uh, for example, here in the Cordillera, um, some of the rice terrace systems, which I'll be talking about, are falling under disrepair. Areas under Sweden agriculture or rotational farming have been shrinking and there has been a rapid change in foods, uh, diets, and nutrition. So I think uh, we need to uh, realize indeed that we are in a historic transition in food and agricultural policy. Link, but this will be very closely linked to transitions in knowledge and technologies, including our visions, our planning, and our actions on the revitalization of indigenous and local food systems. Um, at this point, I'd like to say that when we first had the UN Year on Biodiversity, indigenous peoples underlined that we shouldn't start taking a telescope and looking closely at indigenous um, cultures in isolation from the relationship with the global system that has impacted on indigenous cultures. And I think uh, similarly in this workshop, we must uh, do the same because if we do not address the power relations that are affecting and transforming food systems, then uh, we will not adequately address the needed uh, changes and support to support indigenous uh, food systems. Because it's only more recently that the full impacts of industrial agriculture have become better understood as systemic drivers of biodiversity loss climate change, and gross social inequality. And the current pandemic highlights the vulnerability of global food chains, pointing to transitions from carbon-intensive food production and consumption patterns towards more resilient and sustainable uh, local food systems. So I will look at some of the uh, food systems that I'm a bit more familiar with. For example, in my home region in the Cordillera, Philippines, systems based on agroforestry, for example, um, shifting cultivation or rotational farming linked with terraced agriculture and also uh, home gardens. Because uh, these um, are some um, local food systems which are common to many indigenous peoples in Asia. So uh, taking, for example, uh, rotation agriculture or Sweden farming. In fact, from the beginning of highland development interventions by government, uh, this is true in the Philippines, it's true in Thailand, there has been a misconception of rotational farming as the cause of deforestation. And that is a view coming from uh, scientific uh, forestry, right? And so the policy has been to replace rotational farming with sedentary farming, emphasizing commercial crop production. Moreover, forestry laws do not recognize indigenous peoples living in forested or protected areas, even when our residential uh, homes and farmlands have been uh, occupying this uh, spaces or we have been living in these lands over long periods. So cash crops have been uh, promoted, supported by government projects and private business. However, for example, in Thailand, rotational farming still exists in around 50% of the current communities, right? And uh, more recently, a cabinet resolution covering current livelihoods recognizes the traditional and dynamic practice of agriculture and its uh, coexistence with the natural ecosystem. So this um, resolution, cabinet resolution, promulgates uh, special cultural zones for the revival and maintenance of cultural identity in harmony with nature. And this uh, recognition of rotation agriculture has strengthened the local economy, 
some young people now see their communities as their place for growth and innovation, reclaiming um, livelihoods with cultural identity. So um, this will be an important area to look at because um, it requires um, more research. The excellent research already done on uh, rotational farming uh, in Thailand, but ac across Asia. This was also supported with uh, research with FAO. Has shown that this continues to be a major um, significant uh, way of uh, indigenous food systems uh, supporting uh, genetic diversity and traditional foods. And if the decline continues, this will be a serious uh, problem across uh, countries in Asia. Um, we can look at the features of rotation farming uh, further in, uh, yeah, in this workshop. Now I look at uh, some features of terraced uh, rice agriculture. So the Central Cordillera region and its terraced rice agriculture, it's also practiced actually in many mountain areas in Asia. And uh, particularly the Ifogao rice terraces in uh, the Cordillera has been recognized as a living cultural heritage, right? Now, if we look at these rice terraces as a whole food system, in fact, they, they are a very ingenious um, technological system of rice fields supported by sophisticated irrigation and water management systems and associated uh, cultural uh, values, social institutions, and uh, spiritual link. To, uh, to nature, right? So this is not just uh, production of food within the terraces. It combines actually forest, water, and land management across the landscape. It uses sophisticated indigenous technology, knowledge, and institutions. And uh, within the landscape, it really contains uh, multiple uh, values. For example, for governments and for outsiders. It has uh, massive uh, tourism values <laughs> and uh, the focus, for example, on the terraces. However, for a lot of the farmers, the larger values are in the management of the water system and the forested area above the rice fields, which maintains uh, water and uh, good um, ecosystem functions within that landscape. Of course, it has enormous uh, heritage uh, and ecosystem values, uh, water and carbon management, of course, uh, subsistence and food values, and uh, traditional occupations, not just as rice farmers, but as wood carvers, weavers, basketry, and a whole range of other um, traditional occupations. Now, again, linking to the bigger system, the green revolution has introduced changes in the use of hybrid seeds. And today, a lot of those uh, best varieties are now in the seed banks. And uh, it's great that the potato park has been able to achieve uh, repatriation. We still have a lot of heritage rice uh, varieties, but now, a lot of the uh, rice is marketed to the urban centers and niche markets abroad. And we are in a bad situation where in local people are actually buying the cheaper rice and selling their best uh, rice. So here again, the economic uh, imbalance in um, support for our rural uh, food systems needs to be looked at so that uh, the good benefits are also retained while contributing to, uh, for example, supply chains or outside uh, markets. Let's also look at uh, urban transitions. Um, for, for example, for indigenous peoples, most of whom live in Asia, right? we still have 72% more or less in the rural areas. 
whereas in some regions like in North America and uh, Latin America, we are now uh, having more indigenous peoples living in um, urban areas, which means that issues of food systems of uh, indigenous peoples also in the urban areas needs to be looked at. Now, there is still good urban rural interlinkages in our food systems. For example, during the pandemic, uh, the rural areas were actually supplying food to indigenous peoples in the urban areas who were um, suffering um, food shortages because of the breakdown, say, in food chains or because of affordability and uh, accessibility, right? So for example, here in uh, Baguio City, where I'm from, uh, one of the strongest traditional food systems were the home gardens. These are close to the um, houses, were in um, wild and domesticated uh, food crops, as well as animals are kept uh, nearby. And this has been actual enhancement of uh, genetic diversity because these home gardens have been found to be sometimes richer in uh, diversity than even in some of the, um, the, forest, uh, the forest areas, right? Because of uh, also the exchange and experimentation that is done by uh, indigenous peoples. And um, I was able to visit, for example, the home gardens in Kendi in Sri Lanka. And here, uh, every home is really surrounded by a lot of uh, biodiversity and plants and animals that are used for medicine, for food, for exchange, and for uh, strengthening the security of the, of the families. But because of the high value crops that are planted there, they're also the suppliers of nutmeg and other spices uh, to near and distant uh, markets. And uh, these home gardens are uh, continue to be quite important. So um, I think um, it, we need to see this transition period as a great opportunity because um, there is now an openness to really explore diversity as a very important element of uh, the food systems for the future. Local, resilient, and uh, yeah, diverse. And um, I think by hearing more uh, and educating and researching these food systems, then uh, we can make an important contribution to uh, better food systems in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joji. You're so knowledgeable and I really appreciate your presentation it was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, you know, the context of where we are at the moment with food systems, this huge inequalities in power between agribusiness and you know small farmers and indigenous farmers are really at the core of these issues of, that are threatening indigenous food systems and um, as you also highlighted you know markets are also really important um, needing to be better supporting indigenous foods um, and um, it was really interesting to hear about the wild and the domesticated uh, genetic resources enriching each other in the home gardens. So thank you so much. Um, I think unfortunately we probably don't have time for a Q&A now. I think we're going to have to just keep going. So sorry about that, but we'll have time for a Q&A after the next two presentations. So could I ask now uh, Simon Mitambo, please, from um, He's going to speak about indigenous food systems in Africa and Kenya. And just for a quick introduction. Um, so Simon is a, um, an initiated African leader of the Taraka tribe in Kenya. And he works with the African Biodiversity Network as a regional programs coordinator. Thank you. Please go ahead, Simon. Yeah, thank you, Christina, and uh, uh, I greet everyone. Like you have seen, my name is Simon. Um, uh, I think for for me, uh, looking at this subject of indigenous food systems, 
uh, I, 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 was, I was trying to look at how do we as indigenous people also understand this because uh, there are many definitions, but I see it as uh, an area where uh, we have uh, a number of certain elements that uh, are a bit of, of nature and the culture that have sustained the web of life uh, among the indigenous people. And uh, some of these have been crops, uh, livestock, uh, issues around land, uh, sacred natural sites, soil, uh, and so many things, and the water. And um, I want also to say that uh, when we discuss this issue of indigenous food system, uh, for me and for, for us here in Africa, I find that uh, uh, we cannot talk about food without talking about seed, because seed is the, the, the critical, is the, is the core in, 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 in our production of food in also carrying our identity. Because when you talk about seed, you find in seed, there is sacredness around uh, what we are speaking about. So I think uh, most of the, my discussion and presentation, I'll be mostly referring to seed. And because of course, without seed, we, we do not have food. Without seed also, we, we don't have uh, our cultural identity and uh, seed is also very critical in, uh, in uh, giving us our cultural identity, governance, and the issues of spirituality. Uh, for example, if you come to Daraka today, the kind of food you eat there will make you feel that you are in a Daraka and you are not uh, somewhere else in Benin, for example. So that by itself uh, it gives people a uh, cultural identity and of course, uh, there are traditions and practices around how that food is uh, uh, prepared and how that food is also served. And uh, that food is also not eaten by the members of the family who are alive around. You will find that sometimes uh, the communities will have to poor elevations also to bring that touristic. So in a sense, uh, it gives us the, 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 the identity, it gives us uh, the, the spiritual uh, perspective, B because again, um, we will find that also when you go to communities uh, across Africa, there are certain ceremonies they might want to do, and they can't also do these ceremonies without a particular seed. So it becomes very uh, important within their indigenous food system to be able also to identify in different scenes, either for nutritional value, uh, either for ceremonial value, and for many other purposes in terms of being able to be resilient in their, in their, in their way of, of life. And again, uh, it's also very important to realize that uh, it has to be that particular seed. And in most of the ceremonies, you'll find that uh, they will not use a foreign seed. So the whole issue of genetically modified, uh, for them is not an issue because it's not a, their seed. They don't know it, the ancestors don't know it. They know the color, they know all that that they need to do. And uh, also in uh, the indigenous uh, communities of Africa, you find that uh, uh, seed, seed drives the day-to-day -day activities. If we are beginning to wake up and uh, to go to farm or to do the weeding, uh, there are some things that cannot take off before we do something so that uh, we get better relationship with our land, with our farms. It's just like uh, when we are preparing, for example, to plant, there are certain ratios that have to happen. If we know that the rain is going to come, there are ways that uh, we cleanse the, the land and the tree uh, so that we receive the, the gift of nature, uh, which is rain. So you find uh, in most cases, when it is a season where the, the rain is going to come, there is a, a very particular way that uh, we prepare our grounds. And the seed plays a very uh, critical role. And looking at the resilience, again, you find that uh, most of the work that revolve around our indigenous food system and around the seed, are usually collective and uh, in a sense they bring 
cohesion and integration among the members of the, the, the community. Uh, uh, I was also looking at the, the way SIND also played the role in the new COVID disease when uh, uh, COVID disease was uh, uh, declared and uh, came here in Africa. Uh, the fear about the disease was more than even the effect of the disease itself. So by doing the rituals that the communities did, uh, that alone helped them to come together and uh, to, to, to be there for one another. And that also helped them to, to manage the, 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 the whole effect of uh, the, 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 the COVID or any other uh, pandemic. And these have been part of the practices around seed that bring the cohesion and the resilience among uh, these uh, communities. And uh, also another feature that is also very important when we discuss uh, our indigenous food system and also seed, uh, we find that uh, seed like here in my community, for example, is actually shared and it is not sold. And they have a difference between seed and the food. And the elders say these days, uh, we don't even plant seed, we, we plant food. Because when you go to the market to buy food, is what you come and plant. There is a way seed is generated, either by way of selection, and there are different uh, processes that go around that. Uh, so uh, in an answer, I think uh, that gives you a sense of how we look at the seed, uh, the features and the perspective that uh, we have uh, here in Africa. Uh, looking at also the, the, the trends, uh, what I find is that uh, there is a big loss, especially here in Africa, because uh, again, uh, due to colonization, uh, we have been introduced to a lot of uh, technologies. And uh, some of the laws that we inherited are the colonial laws. Uh, and uh, some of these laws also continue to deprive us of our indigenous food system. Uh, and you find uh, such laws that uh, uh, really undermine, they promote patenting of the seed. And you, you see, seed is supposed to be owned uh, collectively. And um, there is a lot of push for hybrids, just uh, like uh, uh, Georgie was saying. Uh, of course, uh, with the uh, Green Revolution here in Africa, that those effects have continued the government at the national level, at the county level, uh, here in Kenya and across other parts of Africa, uh, really in push of these hybrids. And we know the effect of the hybrids and the chemicals, uh, how they do to our soils, how they do to our water. And also Africa is synonymous also with the corruption. And uh, we have also cases where uh, some, of the, some of the laws cannot also happen because there is a lot of anti-twisting between the government officials and the multinationals. And at the same time, also you find uh, that uh, in situations where we have uh, incompetence institutions, it becomes also difficult to implement even the few laws that are, uh, uh, that are promotive to, to our indigenous food system. And uh, save for the lifestyle diseases that I imagine, and the pandemics like uh, Corona. Uh, we have also seen lately that uh, there has been an unprecedented revival of our indigenous food system. And the value now is slowly uh, finding their way. Whether with the policy or without the policy, we find that everyone now is embracing, is asking for these uh, traditional foods and things like that. And another important point to notice also that uh, there is an emerging, in the rural Africa, there is an emerging uh, leadership uh, of women because again, here in Africa, women are the experts of the seed. So they are able to assert themselves. They are able, they are, they are quite eco-literate. They are able to, lead, to read the climate, to read the, the ecosystem, and also be able to understand the, 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 the cycles of nature and when it comes to seed and nursing, for example, they are able to say this is the right season to plant this crop. This is not the right season to do this. Uh, sorry. And so just to, to end up now, what we are doing with all these challenges of policy and the corruption, uh, we are engaging communities with uh, community dialogues and exchange learning. 
and uh, we are also doing maps and calendars to be able to understand these cycles and also to support community research and uh, also working with the uh, uh, Western trained scientists who can uh, understand the language of the farmers and can support them in their research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Simon Mitambo. That's great to have that focus on seeds and the collective ownership and all these features which are really core of many indigenous food systems in Africa and also across the world. Um, I think we need to um, move on to, um, we're now going to look at the role of indigenous food systems in health and nutrition and it, we're very um, happy to have Harriet Kuhnlein who's prepared a video because it's very very early for her. So um, uh, just to briefly introduce Harriet is a professor and a nutritionist and a founding director at the Center for Indigenous Peoples Nutrition and Environment in uh, McGill University in Montreal. So Har Harriet, I think you're there, but we, we have a video to present. Um, is that right? Well, hello and good morning to everyone. And thank you for having me as a participant in this really interesting session. I'm going to start with giving you a little bit of background uh, in my work with Indigenous peoples. I am a nutritionist and a dietitian by academic training at the undergraduate level and then through to nutritional sciences at the PhD level. And my first work was with the desert environment in Arizona with the Hopi people. And then following my appointment as an assistant professor at British Columbia University of BC, I worked with the New Hawk Nation people uh, for more than 10 years, really, before moving on to McGill University in Montreal, Canada, where I eventually became the founding director of the Center for Indigenous Peoples Nutrition and Environment and a professor in the School of Human Nutrition. So during that time, I worked for many years, oh, 10 to 15 years, in the Canadian Arctic uh, with First Nations and Inuit communities. And this was uh, conducted in very close collaboration with the Canadian Indigenous leaders, which gave a lot of guiding advice on how to do good community consultations, and they assisted with that. So the work was, was very successful. And we studied the benefits and risks of traditional food system use in the Arctic. There were several concerns at that time about organochlorine and heavy metal contaminants and the government as well as the indigenous communities wanted to thoroughly research uh, the indigenous people's food systems. Now, following that work, then I worked with FAO uh, and the nutrition division. Actually, I was on sabbatical leave and worked in collaboration with the nutrition division, still as a McGill professor. And uh, over about 25 years, you can tell I'm, I'm getting up there. <laughs> so about 25 years working with cultures in different parts of the world, rural cultures of indigenous peoples on their food systems. Now I am an emerita professor living in Anacortes, Washington state in the United States in the Coast Salish and Samish territories. So, that gives you some kind of a understanding of the extent of work I've done with Indigenous peoples. And I want to call your attention to the fact that Indigenous peoples' health and nutrition, you need to think about four essential aspects of uh, health that all Indigenous peoples uh, attend to and that we at Sine also have to pay attention to. The physical aspects, which we often focus on as nutritionists, the spiritual, social, and mental or intellectual aspects. So all of these have to be taken into account when you're working on food systems with indigenous peoples. Our sustained research focus was on diversity in the food systems and on the nutrient composition. And this was because our perspective was that if you want to do uh, if, if you want to work with indigenous peoples on health promotion and nutrition, 
uh, you really need to know what you're working with. You have to understand the food system, the diversity and the composition, particularly in nutrition. And with that information, then you can build the health promotion conversation. When documenting and promoting uh, food systems for health and well-being, you also have to keep in mind that indigenous peoples everywhere have a dichotomy of what they're eating. They have their traditional foods uh, and they have commercial foods and it is in, in different proportions depending on their particular uh, stage of development, their economics and so forth. So when you're working with dietary data, uh, you have to think about separating, you get your data and you separate it according to days with and days without traditional food. And that gives you a, a clear picture then of what species are being used, what nutrients are contained in the diet and so forth. <clears throat> in the Arctic example, 45 communities is for, of First Nations and Inuit, as I mentioned, um, when that dichotomy was conducted in the research setting, there was significantly more protein and other, and other nutrients such as minerals and vitamins that were contained in the days that contained at least one serving of traditional food, not the whole diet, but at least one serving in contrast to days without traditional food. So significantly more protein, and many nutrients uh, in those days with traditional food. And keep in mind, the Arctic traditional foods are primarily animal source foods. On the days without traditional food, significantly more energy, fat, and sugar. And along the way, we found many nutrient sur surprises because we had uh, thousands of samples into our laboratories at the center in Montreal. Vitamin C, for example, with just one small serving of muktuk, which is the outer, <clears throat> the outer skin and the blubber of whale, you get as much vitamin C as you would in a standard glass of orange juice. Vitamin A, uh, another component that people think of in fruits and vegetables, uh, in, is in plentiful supply when all parts of the animal are being consumed, which indigenous cultures do. So with our uh, 12 case studies with the FAO experience, um, I mentioned, I will mention that all the publications are in line, are online, but we had um, with collaboration of FAO and our uh, nutritionists in different parts of the world, we worked with three North American cultures, two South American cultures, two in Africa, one in the Pacific, and four in Asia. And so there were many interdisciplinary partners that came on side, both at the center in Montreal and in country to do the work. So the first step was to develop the methodology for documenting uh, the food systems. And uh, this publication is online with FAO as well as the center website in Montreal. And it documents five different steps to use in this documentation. So once that methodology was created, which took, you know, from start up until we got the publication together, it was about four years. And then we proceeded with 12 case studies, as I mentioned, those 12 case studies, with this publication, which is online, the FAO website, Indigenous Peoples, Food Systems, The Many Dimensions of Culture, Diversity, and Environment for Nutrition and Health. So there are 12 chapters there that describe the food systems, um, how and why they are used, people's feeling about it, and um, so forth. And for example, um, the documentation in Micronesia in the Pacific, uh, we found with Dr. Lois Engelberger's collaboration that the Karat banana, which is the favorite banana of children in that island, more two th upwards beyond 2,000 micrograms of carotene in contrast to the normal banana that we all eat, the Cavendish banana of less than five micrograms. 
This is another one of the surprises, the cultural activities as well as the um, environmental risks were part of the documentation. So when we brought our partners together in a, in a center in Italy, the Bellagio Center, uh, they, they, we all agreed, okay, we have this great information. We know what's in our food system. We have a good idea of the nutrients, but what are we gonna do with this information? We can't stop there. We have to use this information to improve the health of our people. So that started the next phase of the FAO collaboration. Another, oh gosh, eight years and more until the publication got completed. Um, Indigenous Peoples Food Systems and Wellbeing Interventions and Policies for Health Promotion. So this is basically about the strategies to improve food use by uh, um, giving information to the local people and employing local staff to help in the conversion to better diets. So I think my time is about up and I will close there. And thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Harriet. I think that was a video because it's very early for her. Um, great to hear about these issues that. Um, I personally have worked a lot less on, but I think the really important case um, that, that the fact that indigenous foods are often more nutritious is a really important um, uh, case for advocating for their importance as well as their climate resilience. So um, we have a little bit of time now for any questions. Um, you can, you're free to raise your hand, but um, also use the um, participants um, uh, so the zoom hand raise function if you click on participants you should be able to do it that way and um, if we run out of time you can put your question in the chat but please say who it's for thank you so does anybody have any questions uh, okay we do have questions okay um, I'm Forgive me for mispronouncing this, but Merush Tak has. Um, no. Hi, Christina. That Sorry. was perfect pronunciation. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you. Um, um, uh, and thanks for the time for all the, um, all the speakers today. It's really interesting to hear from everyone. Um, and it's particularly interesting to hear about how colonial laws, for example, have you know, shaped. Um, contemporary times um, and then still are shaping them. Um, my question is not a particular to any one speaker, but I wanted to perhaps hear from anyone who might have um, um, uh, dealt with or experienced um, um, uh, perhaps um, uh, contra contradiction or like um, uh, or barriers to policy making when it comes to indigenous food systems and traditional food systems. With with state actors, um, particularly, I mean, I guess there are there are some contradictions or barriers with private sector, but like in sometimes these barriers can also um, um, uh, be placed by um, national governments or local governments. And I was wondering if um, there were any experiences that our speakers or perhaps even like the participants have uh, had where where that um, that uh, the contradiction comes in into place so it relates to power relationships i guess in in those spaces um uh, so yeah i would like to hear more if if there were any experiences people wanted to share so your question relates to how to overcome these uh, power inequalities to promote indigenous food systems in policy yes spaces okay much better described than i did <laughs> <laughs> okay so um that's a very good question um would any of the speakers like to answer that possibly um well anybody joji has a hand up would you like to answer that joji please go ahead uh yes in relation to uh quite a dominant uh, food system, rotational farming in Asia, government policy actually um, criminalizes this activity. 
So not only do we not have a secure land tenure over forested lands, uh, the practice of uh, rotational farming, which does use uh, burning and moving across the landscape and leaving the lands fallow over a certain period, means that, for example, we have uh, indigenous farmers who are imprisoned in Thailand because uh, they have very heavy fines for practicing uh, rotation farming. So uh, the policy barriers there are lack of uh, tenure, security, over our lands because uh, a lot of the forests are uh, designated as forest lands where they prohibit this uh, practice. So the law will also need to change not only to respect indigenous peoples but to um, enable customary uh, resource use and management as in fact um, a good way of uh, managing the landscape. And uh, I think that recognition of the special cultural zones in Thailand is at least a movement towards that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Joji. Um, so we have another question from Frank Roy. Please go ahead, Frank. Um, thank you very much, uh, Joji, uh, for that explanation and also uh, for the, the other panelists. I just have one simple question. Uh, Regarding Simon Matambo made an interesting remark about uh, the seed cultures and how uh, it helped to manage COVID-19. I didn't quite uh, get that point, so I'll be uh, grateful if he can either speak or uh, give her a, a response to that for my education. Thank you. Thank you for the for the question. Um, uh, what I was saying is, the, I, I was talking about the, the role that uh, the seed uh, ceremonies uh, play in bringing uh, communities together uh, in times of pandemics. And uh, you know, when they perform these ceremonies, is is a collective uh, affair of everyone participating and coming together uh, physically, spiritually, and psychologically, and so. Uh, what I was saying is that uh, when they did these this rituals, again, there are certain elements that also go with some of these ceremonies, like uh, ceremonies of uh, social safeguard and uh, some, some, some abstinence. So uh, simply what I, was, uh, what I was saying is that uh, when community come together in times of pandemic or other threat uh, for these ceremonies, they, they, they feel that in belonging and that collective uh, inclusivity in facing the, the challenges that are facing them. So I was looking at it like uh, another level where they come together uh, to, 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 to have that inclusive and a collective uh, undertaking of, of something that threatened them. So their traditional seeds bring them together through these ceremonies. Yeah, bring them together. And so there's social and, uh, resilience. Yeah, and I was even talking about how the COVID in particular was uh, communicated to Africa, especially in the rural. There was a lot of fear. I said there was more fear about the disease than even the effect of it. So that every moment you are feeling like you are sick, you see, because of that fear. And, but when they, they come together for such a, a collective undertaking, it, it, it removes the fear and uh, brings collective responsibility and uh, caretaking upon each other. Thank you very much, Simon. So I have some questions in the chat. Uh, one from Harriet Deacon for any panelist. What are the potential risks and benefits of commercializing traditional foods? in terms of their value to and use by indigenous communities. Um, perhaps um, Joji could address that one, um, as I think you touched on that issue of commercialization, or anybody else is free to if they would like. Yeah, um, maybe I'll expand a little bit on uh, this heritage rise. 
so indeed the highland rice in the cordillera, several kinds, uh, the red, the black, they all have different flavors and uses. Uh, the government uh, department of trade introduced a program called heritage rice and they set certain standards for the production of that rice, right? And uh, it was meant for export to uh, niche markets in the United States with uh, relatively high prices. And so many communities that were brought into this program started selling their best rice for the market, right? And uh, were buying cheaper rice coming from the outside for their own food. So of course, this uh, rice is not yet uh, produced in large quantities. Therefore, there was a displacement of who uh, got and ate this. But then it had another impact, which was when they realized that this rice had um, high prices, they started planting wide areas for this rice, <laughs> whereas we used to have mosaic of rice varieties in different elevations. Then they started uh, mass producing this and um, in fact starting to reduce diversity. It was in fact heritage varieties mm. that were now being uh, planted in big quantities so that they could sell them. Then there were additional impacts because this is uh, traditionally pounded. And then when they started setting standards for what would be sold, they didn't want to accept rice which, had, which was sometimes broken or, you know, which didn't look all exactly the same. And after bringing their um, rice to the centers for trade, sometimes they would be turned back and would, the rice wouldn't be bought, right? So uh, there are many um, aspects around commercialization and market um, values that need to be examined vis-a-vis -vis the traditional and even the nutritional needs of communities. Uh, it does show a great need for um, access to the market, right? But uh, this, uh, if not done uh, properly, can have a lot of uh, unintended impacts, which are not uh, attended to by those who are focusing on productivity or um, sales. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. I think we're nearly out of time, but obviously the commercialization issue raises a lot of dif you know, difficulty, potential adverse impacts that need to be done, looked at very carefully. Um, just finally, um, there's a comment in the chat from Roger Blench. What about cassava? This is about as unnutritious as possible from the Amazon, but dominant in West Central Africa. So yes, um, it has become that and maize. Uh, we have a, a, a response from Raj Puri um, in the chat box. Cassava is a calorie rich vegetable that contains plenty of carbohydrate and key vitamins and minerals. Cassava is a good source of vitamin C, thiamine, riboflavin and niacin. The leaves, which are also edible if a person cooks them or dries them in the sun, can contain up to 25% of protein. So I think you've, you've had that exchange. I've, I've read the answer. Um, I'm afraid we'll run out of time now. So thank you so much to all the speakers and to all the participants. And we have one uh, hand raised. I'm so sorry, I didn't see you, Jan, there. Very quickly, please, because we, we've run out of time. I, I wanted to, to touch upon the first question in the, in the questions and answer. And um, that is the, the challenge of, of putting together policy within the dominant um, culture uh, right now. I think that's something crucial and where we need a collective effort from all of us. Um, the first one is probably there's need for new metrics and new terminology. If we looked at the, at the metrics uh, uh, and concepts relating to food, it's mainly uh, a bonus in and, and pricing quantities versus quality. I think Harriet talked about, for example, the micronutrient content of, of certain foods. And sometimes these foods are ugly in terms of appearance. Therefore, they don't have a market price or they don't have a market value, like Joji was talking about the broken uh, rice uh, that's been processed traditionally. 
this is a major loss for humanity and for all of us. The second one is we need to broaden the food base with the presence dominance of, of three crops that are feeding humanity is very unlikely that we are going to have sustainable uh, food systems. Um, the, the other thing very important is challenging uh, what the scientists tell us. I remember when I grew up, uh, we, we never knew any oil other than olive oil. Then there was a huge campaign telling us that olive oil was very bad for cholesterol and we had to consume uh, sunflower oil. And we found out later that there were very important lobbies behind this change of habits and it was basically economically driven and it had no health implications whatsoever. Many of the indigenous peoples and indigenous nations, they live across uh, borders. And that's a major issue when you put together policies to support uh, indigenous food systems or indigenous peoples. We don't have an understanding, neither scientists nor the UN, of uh, mobile livelihoods. And I think Georgie was explaining that very well. We tend to disregard or not fully understand the benefits of mobile livelihoods from nomadic people to shifting cultivation. And would you look at the policies and, uh, and framework in place to support mobile livelihoods is negligible. When we have almost a billion people that depend of mobile livelihoods all over the world, from mobile uh, pastoralists to indigenous peoples that practice shifting cultivation. So all of these are things that we need to incorporate into our research and we need to expand um, our conceptual framework. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for highlighting those really important points. I think I've heard we need more research on indigenous people's food systems with and um, supporting indigenous researchers themselves and we need um, to ensure that research is very much rooted in the wider context, the policies, the political economy, the power inequalities um, that need to shift and as part of that shifting metrics, what is measured, not just quantities of food but quality of food so on that, I hope it's been useful for you. I've learned a huge amount. Thank you so much. And we'll be back at, um, well, in now um, 25 minutes for an in-depth immersive session uh, to the Andes. So we're going to Latin America. Um, so 1300 British summertime. I hope you can all join and have some time for some delicious indigenous foods for your lunch. Thank you very much and see you later. Bye. Bye-bye.